the minister's own figures, is that 4.3 billion is not accounted for in our domestic public debt. Claim that was refuted by Minister for Information, Kojo Opo Nkroma. I am saying that the last time they questioned Ghana's figures, it took the country director of the International Monetary Fund to appear on national television to call them out that the sort of computations they were doing were incorrect. Yet they persist in doing this computation with the objective of confusing the Ghanaian public. MP for Yapeku saw John Jinapo in his submission questioned the economic management credentials of government over the three and a half year period in office. Extraordinary time. That is where we see leadership. That is where we think outside the box. Your revenues are dropping to 53 billion, and yet you want to borrow over 50 billion in just one year to finance your deficit. Mr. Speaker, what is innovative about this? Your salary is gone down, and all you are doing is to go and borrow, to come and spend. No wonder today our debt is 258 billion from 120 billion. Day two of the media budget review debate began with the submission of the Minister for Planning, Professor George Anbafo. Deputy Minister for Finance, Charles Edubwahin, however, in his submission, indicated that government had paid 96% of depositors of the defunct microfinance and savings and loans companies. We managed to still provide the protection of the public pens and the judicious use of taxpayers' funds, as well as address the issue with regards to depositors getting paid for their funds that have been locked up. As I said, Mr. Speaker, so, so far we managed to pay out 96% of the uh, uh, depositors. In fact, the reason why we, haven't, we are not closer to 100% was that there were some depositors, especially in the Ashanti region with First Allied, who submitted their claims after the deadline. This was because they had been taken to court and they had to be able to to, to, to sort it out. The reduction of the communications service tax from 9% to 5% created contention during the contribution of sector minister Esla Osu Ekufo and MP for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George. We need to increase the bandwidth and strengthen resilience and security of our networks and manage congestion. We need to connect vital services and ensure the continuity of public services to safeguard the welfare of all our populations. We need to power our fintechs and digital business models to support the most impacted communities. We also need to promote trust, security and safety online and leverage the power of mobile big data. We can do all that by prioritizing digital platforms, digital solutions and digital initiatives. And I'm proud to be part of a government that sees the need to make data as much of a utility as water or electricity. An MNO, which is actually seeking to drive digital inclusion, when they themselves ask that MNO to go into unserved areas, and in going into unserved areas at the request of government, increase their customer base, you turn around and punish them and say that they are a significant market player, and so you are imposing re restrictions on them. You, you talk about in expanding access. You talk about giving access to people to go in there to get access to data. Yet, you, when people try, when companies are investing their own money to get access to Ghanaians, you are punishing them for being SMPs. Mr. Speaker, if government was really serious about digital inclusion in this budget, you would have been seeing a line item saying that from the COVID funds, you are reserving maybe 300 or 400 million Ghana cities to improve last mile connectivity. The conduct of Public Officers Bill 2018 was debated at the second reading stage and approved. On Wednesday, 29th July, the House concluded debate on the statement and request for additional funding of 11.8 billion Ghana cities for the 2020 financial year. The minority leader, Harry Naidrusu, in his submission demanded clarity in respect of expenditure on the management of COVID-19 and disagreed with government's decision to suspend the Fiscal Responsibility Act due to the impact of the pandemic. We are indeed in extraordinary times. With COVID, Twitter away the gains that have been made in the development of the economy. But to suspend our physical rules is just like saying that what we're not meeting the uh, convergence criteria of ECOWAS. We should have run back to Parliament and say that because of volatility in the world, suspend the fiscal rules. That does not measure, that does not measure 
the accounting on those issues. So when you say execution, 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 it's only a mark of grand deception. You don't have any hundred billion to invest in the Ghanaian people. So when you say about Tampa, hundred billion, 2021, 2023, we do not know who will be leading the country. We are optimistic that uh, John Draman and Mahama would have taken over and review some of these uh, decisions that you have uh, taken. A contribution of the majority leader, Oseiche Menta Bonsu, highlighted the economic management record of the Ekufuadu administration amid the pandemic. It is indeed true that expenditures have shot our, have shot our public debt stock to 258.372 billion. The minority leader even quoted two vices. Really, it's 258.372 billion cities, representing the current exchange rate of 45.566 billion. That is 67% of GDP, which increase is mainly at the instance of the Eurobond issuance in February 2020, front loading of expenditures, the COVID 19 effects. An exchange rate depreciation. Whilst Parliament must watch the radar, and I agree with the minority leader, that we must watch the radar of expenditure to ensure that as a country we have value for money. That indeed is the work of Parliament. It is unfortunate and simplistic, however, to suggest that this government has borrowed more monies than any government. The Speaker offered the Minister of Finance, Ken Ofriata, the opportunity to respond to concerns raised by the minority in the course of the debate. In an interview later, the Minister of Finance clearly outlined how government will fund the 11 billion Ghana CDs Ghana Cares program. Side on a 100 billion um, CD, um, CD program over the three year period, uh, which means that government will have to find additional 30 billion of resources. Uh, and what do we intend to do? It's really in our commitment to digitalize the economy, we expect to be able to move our revenue to GDP ratio from the 13% we have now to 20%. Um, that certainly will lead to huge increments in our resources. We also obviously have not done very well with property taxes, and that is an area that we are going to try and mine to look at our gold receipts, etc., and to look at the tax exemptions uh, regime that we have. So through that, we believe we can get a 30 billion. Then there's another 70 billion, uh, which will be a combination of FDI, private sector, domestic and foreign, um, PPPs, etc. And GIPC will be resourced to be a lot more effective than it has been. The Customs Amendment Act received presidential accent in May 2020 but its implementation is expected to begin in November. Ranking member on the Roads and Transport Committee, Gavin Kwame Agboja, says the law, if allowed to take effect, will collapse indigenous businesses in the automotive sector. We don't believe the law as it stands protects lives. And by 1st of November, if this law is allowed to stand, what you will see is a lot of people, thousands of them, losing their job. And the new industry that we wanted to create will not be safe enough to give them any safety in terms of livelihood and that is why we are thinking that the government should tread cautiously this law as crafted is not the one that would, would, would grow the automotive industry in this country it is a rush the same way they did with the the luxury vehicle tax which they have to withdraw because when we told them that it was 40 it would not work they didn't listen to us so we are we are telling government this law will also uh, not work the way you wanted it to be. However, the Communications Minister, Eslo Usuekufu, says the law will rather create better opportunities for the growth of the automotive sector in the country. I know that this is just going to stimulate the economy, grow it, create an additional avenue for jobs to be created in here. Who are those working in the fa factories? Are they not Ghanaians? Are, 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 are these new factories that are assembling uh, cars, not creating jobs for us. You know, it is okay to grant tax exempt, uh, exemptions for businesses that are setting up, to encourage them and to give them space within which to grow. It is done in all sectors. But what I'm hearing is our, P, our colleagues on the other side, as usual, scaremongering, 
poisoning the debate, seeking to turn a section of the economy against the government and bastardizing a very well-intentioned policy that we all agree will provide long-term benefits. We'll take a breather here while you brood over the major issues that made headlines on the floor of Parliament. We'll be back after this break where we'll take a deeper look at the major issues that dominated the headlines in Parliament. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363 on Go TV. Access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back from the break. This is the From the Floor segment. This week, we want to take you through the process of having an important money bill, like the supplementary budget estimates. We want to take you through the process of how it gets approved in Parliament. So we'll begin with bringing you the summary of the debate that happened before the budget statement itself was approved and then take you to the finance committee where the real disintegration of the matters, the line by line item, the scrutiny of the expenditure occurred in parliament. Stay with us for all the intricacies of what happened this week with regards to the media budget review. Mr. Speaker, you also reports 580 million from the World Bank. Then Mr. Speaker, this is significant for me. The Minister for Finance before this media review was in Parliament to rely on Section 36 of the Bank of Ghana Act to borrow 10 billion from the Bank of Ghana in the name of COVID emergency. Now, Speaker, as we speak, the Minister stands in violation of the Constitution, Article 181. The Minister stands in violation of the Public Financial Management Act. Show me a resolution of Parliament where that 10 billion borrowing was approved. He stood here and made a statement. This house, where I see those house, the Minister for Finance must take it seriously. You cannot come to go and want to expend 10 billion just by mere statement. It is not procedurally acceptable. Borrowing is borrowing. Either borrowing under COVID or outside COVID or beyond COVID. You took 10 billion US dollars. The same Bank of Ghana Act provided in section 31 to 7, you relied on 6, where it said that the minister and the controller and the governor of the Bank of Ghana shall determine the limit. Does not mean that the minister should not subject it to the necessary parliamentary approval in accordance with Article 181 of the Constitution. So it's in violation. It further stated, remember, it further stated that they can determine the limit. They can determine the limit. Bank of Ghana money is not public funds. Interesting. Say so when you have the opportunity to speak. 10 billion. Article 181. Subject yourself to it. Because it said that the minister shall determine the limit. But the limit shall not exceed 5% of previous revenue. Previous revenue was 58 billion. It is 10 billion. 10% of 58 billion. So, Minister, you have questions to answer for violations of the Public Financial Management Act, for violations of Article 181 of the Constitution, and for violations of your own Fiscal Responsibility Act. And I have named you a potential candidate for sanctions under some section of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So, we are not going to suspend it. Mr. Speaker, let me let me be concluding 
once again by coming to matters relating to infrastructure, investment in free senior high school. Eight minutes. Investment in free senior high school. I pray and hope that we are not investing in literacy and numeracy tomorrow, even though we are investing in human capital. Statistics have shown that not many of them are able to rise beyond senior high school to higher level to become human capital. Therefore, you see an expenditure item where fiscal infrastructure in health gets only 74 million and fiscal infrastructure and service delivery in education gets 800 million. That disproportionate allocation of those resources and the use of oil revenue for purposes of consumption leaves much to be desired. Then, Mr. Speaker, my tree is not good, so the Sumpahino will borrow me the word when the minister in paragraph 412 talks about Obatampa. <laughs> he as well could have said Obatamboshe, that I'm the mother of promises, not uh, Boshe, Boshe. That's why I said Sumpahino should help me with those words about Boshe. Then, Mr. Speaker, we heard about Agenda 111. The president himself said Agenda 88, so should, who should we believe? And this is not the first time. Yes, the president did well commissioning the Eastern Regional Hospital, but to the credit of the NDC, Central Regional Hospital, Broad Half Regional Hospital, Upper West Regional Hospital, Upper East Regional Hospital, were all infrastructure undertaken by the previous NDC government. Mr. Speaker, I cannot conclude by recognizing that we are indeed in extraordinary times. With COVID, we are away the gains that have been made in the development of the economy. But to suspend our physical rules is just like saying that while we're not meeting the uh, convergence criteria of ECOWAS, we should have run back to Parliament and say that because of volatility in the world, suspend the fiscal rules. That does not measure, that does not measure the counting on those issues. So when you say execution, 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 it's only a mark of grand deception. You don't have any hundred billion to invest in the Ghanaian people. So when you say about Tampa, hundred billion, 2021, 2023, we do not know who will be leading the country. We are optimistic that uh, John Draman and Mahama would have taken over and review some of these uh, decisions that you have uh, taken. So the Bank of Ghana can and should relate to many of those issues. We are told about the fiscal cost of the pandemic, and we are told of shortfalls in revenue. There are problems with the Unipass system at the port. Importers and exporters are complaining about it following the exit of GCNet. We need to have those processes of trade facilitation in order that our importers and exporters can have some pride. Mr. Speaker, this government, uh, smartly, they are very quiet on the exchange rate, rate regime because it, it has some COVID, it now has some COVID symptoms of temperature. When you inherit an exchange rate of 4.2 Ghana cities to a dollar is now 5.8. You must be worried. But Mr. Speaker, what is significant is that in paragraph 245, the minister talks about establishment of a development bank. We do not support it. Strengthen the Agricultural Development Bank, strengthen the NIB, give them liquidity, give them additional resources, and redirect their focus and mission. But to create a new bank, to serve what purpose? To serve what purpose? When the NIB, when the banking sector crisis, today we are told that government has spent 21 billion Ghana cities on banking sector crisis. The banks were only pleading for 400 to 500 million in order to save them to have liquidity. You deny them that and you want to praise yourself for spending 21 billion cities when depositors don't know their future and they are being assured to wait till 2025. That is not acceptable. They are entitled to those deposits and that must be done. Now, as we got paragraph 243, Ghana Amalgamated Trust, what has happened? The minister came here to parliament, got some support in respect of it, and not much have been heard about it. And as I've indicated, paragraph 236 going 
he reports that 21 billion was spent on the banking sector cleanup. In a very solution, and in conclusion, the government must find resources to pay depositors timely for them to be entitled to their resources. So, Mr. Speaker, this budget, media review budget, only comes to me as a manifesto pledge and promise, and reflected reflected the same COVID problem that the minister stated. The economy is having temperature because debt is rising from 120 billion to 256 billion. Uh, importers and exporters are coughing because the exchange regime have gone very high, and the Ghanaian private sector and individuals are sneezing with hardship. You see that. It must be clear to all objective and neutral watchers that the management of the economy under Kufuado is in capable hands, and indeed it was until the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic struck. The regulars of the well-structured well, uh, work program got choked by the virus. The government had to review the plan of action that had been fashioned to take the country to the next level of accelerated economic development, which the minister had themed consolidating the gains for growth, jobs, and prosperity for all. For in sharp contrast to the NDC regime under President Mahama, under Ekufuado, the economy was steadily growing. Industry had started revving up again. Ghana and Ghanaians were clearly on the road to prosperity. The Speaker, the effect of the pandemic has been swift and extremely devastating on the people of the world, businesses, and world economy with 2.2 billion jobs, representing close to 70% of global workforce coming under threat. As the Minister of Finance informed, the pandemic is more than a health crisis. Restrictions were imposed on the movement of people to contain the spread. These restrictions disrupted households and businesses with very many jobs, job losses, and reduced incomes for many people, especially those in private and informal sectors. Yeah. Hotels and the hospitality industry are literally on their knees. The speaker can piece For now, the flagship hotel in the country, they used to employ 360 people in the heat of the, of the uh, coronavirus. 300, 300 out of the 360 workforce have been sent home. Trade and industry, agriculture, health, creative arts, the media, transportation, manufacturing, education, faith-based organizations, financial services, entrepreneurs are all wilted. Social and cultural activities have not been spared. To protect lives and preserve livelihoods from the pulverizing effects of the disease, the president counted with a swift release of the equivalent of 100 million United States dollars preparedness plan, which to address our health vulnerabilities now includes the construction and equipping of 111 hospitals. Undoubtedly, the devastation of the pandemic would bruise and batter our economy and dislocate socio-economic development. It is the reason why the minister has come and in a very forthright manner shown the country where the tumble has taken us from the heights we had achieved. The speaker, total revenue and grants from January to June 2020 amounted to 22 billion, compared to the target of 29.75 billion, a shortfall of 7.752 billion. I refer to paragraph 104, page 21 of the mid-year review. The speaker, that is only for six months. The total expenditure for the period amounted to only 46.352 billion against the projection of 41.55 billion. The gap there is 4.78 billion. This plus a shortfall in the revenue puts the gap between the revenue and expenditure at 12.55 billion between January and June 2020. Mr. Speaker, these are the stark realities. Additional expenditures shall have to be made between July and December 2020. And further shortfalls in revenue would register between 
July and December 2020. It is the reason why the minister has submitted a request for a supplementary budget of 11.896477 billion, which would be required to keep our heads above the water level. Mr. Speaker, it is indeed true that expenditures have shot up, have shot our public debt stock to 258.372 billion. The minority leader even quoted 256. Really, is 258.372 billion cities, representing in current exchange rate of 45.566 billion. That is 67 percent of GDP, which increase is mainly at the instance of the Eurobond issuance in February 2020, front loading of expenditures, the COVID-19 effects, and exchange rate depreciation. Whilst Parliament must watch the radar, and I agree with the minority leader, that we must watch the radar of expenditure to ensure that as a country we have value for money. That indeed is the work of Parliament. It is unfortunate and simplistic, however, to suggest that this government has borrowed more monies than any government. The Speaker, that cannot be true. In 2018, when the NPP has debt, the public debt stock was 9.6 was 9.6 billion. Mr. Speaker, or if you like, 9.7 billion. Mr. Speaker, the rate of exchange at the time was one, one dollar to 1.2 Ghana cities. That meant that the public, the debt stock in US dollars was 8 billion dollars at the point of exit of the MPP in 2008. In 2012, the debt stock climbed up to 36 billion. That meant that the debt had increased by 26.3 billion cities. The speaker, at a, let's even use a NEA exchange rate of one dollar to 187, 1.87. That meant that the increase in dollar terms was 14 billion under peso mills, dollars. In 2016, the debt stock climbed up to 122 billion. That meant that the debt had increased by 86 billion. That is between 2012 and 2016. The end year exchange rate was one dollar to 4.20 or 4.18. That meant that the increase in dollar terms was 21 billion dollars. That meant that the Mills Mahama government added at least 35 billion United States dollars to our debt stock. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, as of yet, the debt has increased to 258, as I've said. The increase is 106 billion, and the rate of exchange is 5.67, which would give the uh, equivalent of 24 billion. What is more important, Mr. Speaker, is for us to measure the debt against the GDP. Mr. Speaker, in 2008, between 2008 and 2016, the increase in, in uh, debt accumulation is 75.8 percent. 75.8 percent. The speaker, in, between 2016 and June, for the year hasn't yet ended, admittedly, is 18 percent. Who are better managers of this economy? Right, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members of the House. I thank you for the opportunity to make a few concluding comments on the debate on the media review of the 2020 budget and the supplementary estimate. But I'd like to begin by quoting the majority leader. The storm of this pandemic has not abated yet. So that is the environment uh, we are in. Mr. Speaker, evident abound that we were on track to transform the economy in line of His Excellency's program and vision of a Ghana beyond aid. There's no gain saying all our flagship programs and initiatives have significantly affected positively the lives of the people of Ghana. Over the past three and a half years, we created a platform for real economic growth 
transformation, strengthening human capital through enhancing access to healthcare, education and skills development, modernizing agriculture and industry, delivering infrastructure across the country, including a revitalized railway subsector and creating jobs. Right on our speaker, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has unleashed severe economic hardships on several economies around the globe, and Ghana has not been spared. Had it not been for the prudent economic measures put in place by this government, the effects would have been far worse than we are witnessing today. Today, Mr. Speaker, most people shudder to think where we would have been if my fellow Ghanaians was not heard in our bedrooms every other day. Mr. Speaker, I want now to respond to some of the issues that uh, were raised. It is truly unfortunate that an attempt has been made um, to politicize the issue of providing food for our brothers and sisters in need during the lockdown period. It is also unfortunate that the impression has been created that the total amount of 54 million Ghana cities was used for only hot meals over these three weeks of a lockdown period. Mr. Speaker, permit me to provide some clarification on the issue. We estimated we need an amount of approximately 40 million to provide hot meals to the vulnerable and five cities a pack during the lockdown period. However, out of this estimated amount, we spent some 12 million on hot meals, including the cost of distribution. Mr. Speaker, government budgeted 40.3 million for basic and cooked food items. We spent 42.2 million. It is this 12 million spent on hot meals with the 42 million spent on uncooked food items that gave the total of 54 million as stated in the media review. Mr. Speaker, the 12.1 million for hot meals fed over 150,000 people during the lockdown, including the cost of transportation and other operational costs. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, our program to support small businesses is very much on course. Today we have 80,000 people who have benefited from the program. Mr. Speaker, it's also important to note that we have spent in excess of 18.6 billion, including over 5 billion in the first half of 2020 alone. On the financial sector, Mr. Speaker, I was looking to respectfully respond to the issues that you have raised. Mr. Speaker, Please allow me to restate what the 11.8 billion supplementary estimate, which includes an amount of 1.84 billion that Parliament approved in March 2020 for emergency COVID-related expenditures requested for, 1.34 billion for the implementation of the COVID-19 preparedness plan one and two to be implemented by the Ministry of Health. The plan two will focus on expanding laboratories to increase the network of functional laboratories for COVID-19 testing for improved database management and coordination, creating isolation centers in all regions and districts, revitalizing the systems for tracking case confirmation and case management, among others. 600 million to mobilize for the construction of for the Agenda 111 in district hospitals. 1.204 million for CAP1 program, which includes the 600 million support for small businesses relief for water during the first three months, support for frontline workers, etc. Mr. Speaker, let me affirm the commitment of the government of, the, of Nana Dudanko Ekufuado to make the well-being of Ghanaians in all our economic transformation agenda paramount. This has been made clearly, this has been clearly demonstrated in the past three and a half years, and especially during the difficult COVID period over the past three years, we spent, we sent some 12 million teenagers to 1.2 million teenagers to senior high school. We fed over 3 million under the school feeding program. 
We provided almost 100,000 graduates for employment and livelihoods. We have provided 64,000 Ghanaians with support under the COVID. We have supported 1.2 million farmers with seeds, fertilizers, and other farming inputs. We provided every constituency with an ambulance, provided free electricity for 1 million lifeline customers, and we have supported 97,000 Ghanaians with small loans under Maslock. We have provided over 142 trainee teachers with allowances for their subsistence. We provided about 150,000 nurse trainees with monthly allowances under the LEAP program. We supported over 1.4 million individuals. We have paid, Mr. Speaker, 96% deposit as funds in the financial restructuring. We have served over 1.8 million people during the lockdown period. Free water for everyone. Mr. Speaker, not only have we managed the macroeconomics, but this is a government that's for the ordinary people, a government that cares, a government that ensures that everybody, citizen, is part of the prosperity that we are seeing. Mr. Speaker, going forward, we all have to sacrifice and burden share. That's revenue mobilization supported by a digitalized economy would ensure that our current 13% revenue to GDP would increase to 20% revenue to GDP. This will enable government to raise the 30 billion Ghana CDs to support the Ghana 100 billion Ghana Cares Obatampa program. In addition, the, the much first areas of property taxes and tax exemption will be fast-tracked to support our 30 billion CD raise. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. We really would like to thank this House um, for the support that we have gotten. And Mr. Speaker, Labour is now very committed to the program and the minority leader knows that he had vexed issues of supplying unemployment insurance and I'd like to tell him that we'll do it for him. Mr. Speaker, let me thank this House and for the support we have gotten over this period and let me assure you, Mr. Speaker, that as long as our God reigns and the battle is the Lord's, we shall bring Ghana to where it rightfully deserves to be. What has road construction got to do with COVID? What has agriculture support got to do with COVID? What has a shortfall in compensation got to do with COVID? And when we want details, we want enough information in order pr to protect the public purse, the majority decides that they will just railroad their way through. We will not be part of that. We have sworn an oath to protect the Constitution. We have sworn an oath to serve the interest of Ghana. I'm a member of Parliament, paid by you, the taxpayer. It is my duty to ensure that every penny, every peso, is well accounted for. This year alone, you are borrowing over 50 billion. Who will pay that money? Does that suggest that the 11.89 billion that is being requested for are things that are, are all funds that are going to be obtained by way of borrowing from outside and not generation from internal sources? Is that what the position that has been presented to the committee by government? The budget clearly states that every peso from this 11.8 billion will be borrowed. Even the subsidy for electricity, we are going to borrow it. You, the ordinary Ghanaian, would eventually pay. That is the truth. And so when we want to investigate this matter, we want to ensure that the right thing is done. This government has just about five months. I'm not being political. It's possible they wouldn't win this election. It's possible that another government would take over. And so when they are taking decisions that have far-reaching implications, we ought to investigate those matters. We ought to be clear. You can railroad through the system. We will not be part of any attempt to rush through the system. The public press must be protected. Is this your personal position or that of the entire minority? Because some of your colleagues are still in the meeting. I am a member of parliament and I've stated my position clearly. The good people of Yape Kosovo constituency voted for me. I'm being paid by you, the taxpayer, your money. And I have to do the right thing. I'll take my debate to the floor. 
And I can assure you that I'll take my debate to the floor. So, so when you say you'll not be part of it, what? Um, you I'm saying I can't approve this. Approve I can't approve this amount on the surface of it. Because it doesn't meet even simple public financing system. If you tell me that you want to pay an outstanding claim, let me just show you this, please. Just one minute. Payment of outstanding claims. District Assembly's Common Fund. 144 million. What does outstanding claim mean? The District Assembly Common Fund is a percentage of total revenue. It presupposes that that revenue has been collected. This is simple. And you want to go and borrow to pay for monies you have collected but you cannot account for. What kind of what kind of what kind of analysis is this? We can't allow that. I will not be part of this. No, I won't be part of this. It won't happen. But, but just to clear this up for us, we thought the budgetary estimates were approved yesterday. What's the really are you doing here that would we'll have to come back? To we you? haven't approved the budget estimates. We have to go through the estimates. You have to justify that estimates before we go to Parliament. He wants to suspend the fiscal responsibility act. He, he says he and he hasn't convinced me. If he had convinced me, I would have started to vote for him. Look, let us learn to do what is right. It's not about me. It's not about elections. It's about this country. We owe it a duty to do what is right and proper. And please, let's learn to do what is right and proper. We don't let political alignments and inclinations cloud our judgment. Let's do what is proper and what is right. So, so just to be sure, on the two fronts, in terms of approval of the budgetary estimates, as well as the request for the suspension of the Fiscal uh, Responsibility Act, uh, you are voting against that. Alongside how, do I, how do I approve the suspension of the Fiscal Responsibility Act when I'm not convinced of the need to borrow more? The essence of the suspension of the Fiscal Responsibility Act is that you want to cross a certain threshold of your deficit. And if you want to cross that threshold of a deficit, it means that you are incurring a certain expenditure. I ought to be convinced that that expenditure is justified. If that expenditure is not justified, I cannot approve a fiscal responsibility, extension, or breaching of the law for you. Committee were two. One, to approve the suspension of the fiscal rules, and two, to approve the supplementary estimate of 11.896 billion. So the Minister of Finance and his team came, we considered both. Uh, as to the suspension of the fiscal rules, I think it's within the minister's power to suspend it, and then he informs parliament and we give approval. Then on the supplementary estimates, the 11.8962, they've given a detailed breakdown of all that goes into it. And so I think uh, by and large, we are, we are satisfied. There's a contention that most of the estimates that came are not directly related to the management of um, the, 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 the pandemic around, which is which is the case that the minority yeah, the was making. Consequences. I know media men were laid off because of the COVID. Was it direct? The indirect consequences of COVID. Do you understand? So when uh, educational institutions close now, the watch seller does not come. That's an indirect consequence of the COVID. Do you understand? So there are indirect consequences. So all the provisions being made, they are not direct. If it, go, if it is going to build hospitals, if it is going to a health insurance authority or paying for Ministry of Health expenditure, that is direct. But there are indirect consequences too. They point to things like this should assembly, common fund, election year, budget, other yeah, things that are gone down. So you and my new job in South uh, Municipality to suffer because revenues have gone down. We have to shut them up so that business activity can continue. Yeah. If, if, if you can briefly tell us what the position of the minority was at the meeting that we held over the supplementary estimates. Yes, uh, we felt that uh, the whole submission by the minister is not in line with what uh, we, we expected in a supplementary budget. We are of the opinion that many of the items listed and for which funds are being requested in the supplementary budget are not directly related to COVID-19. But the posture is that COVID-19 has destroyed everything and that is why there is the need to uh, bring a supplementary budget requesting for 11.8 billion Ghana cities. But by our workings, the, that should not have been the case. And so, if it were not going to be that high, then it is possible that we might not even achieve the sh the the deficit beyond six percent in which case there wouldn't be any need to suspend the fiscal responsibility act that was the position that we tried to uh, present at the meeting for instance 
in this supplementary budget, you are asking for 580 million to establish the National Development Bank. How, how is it related to this? The argument is that it has had, uh, I mean, the pandemic has had a tell on effect on all other all other things. So government cannot raise revenue. So if they are going to borrow to fund expenditure, it means that the plans that government has must still not must must still not you know be started must still hold so if they are going to go for money you should go into some of these areas don't you agree no we don't because if you are in times of exigency you don't need to bring everything on board yeah sometimes because of your difficulty you reduce what you had planned earlier to do that is the essence of uh, being in an emergency so you don't go back and rake all the old things that you plan to do under normal times when you are in a, a, an emergency situation. That is our position. So uh, we, we think that this thing is, is, is just some other means to have access to funds in an election year. We, we are not particularly happy. EC, Electoral Commission is taking additional 300. National Identification is taking another 300. And the outstanding claims, you know, uh, statutory funds like the District Assembly's Common Fund, national health insurance and those funds which get fund they you had collected revenues for them already they are they are ratios they are rates of the the na national revenue which you had already collected and you were supposed to release them and you did it now you are bringing the payment of those outstanding claims into a supplementary budget because of covid these are some of the things which aren't very clear at all. You should have paid these monies long, long ago. As soon as you draw down revenue, you pay to, to the various uh, statutory bodies. I get far like this assembly's common fund. Now, you are bringing, bringing these payments in as if they were your, your inability to pay in the past were occasioned by COVID-19. So the whole thing is unclear and uh, 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 we have made our position very clear, but as you know, the ruling party will use its majority to bulldoze its way through. But we want the world, we want Ghanaians to know that these are not COVID-19 related expenditures for which the minister is asking 11.8 billion and also asking to suspend the fiscal responsibility and that that issue we were oh i mean we we saw it yes that i mean the law says that if the minister would come and make the statement on the floor of the house and once it's approved they get to the committee to scrutinize what has has been said what was the case that was made at the committee and what's what's exactly your disagreement because it's clear that there's a public health emergency that would not allow government to meet its target fine we agree that where it is related to covid 19 then it is a public health emergency. It's an, uh, uh, a situation where we, we, we cannot do other than to do, to, I mean, to approve these expenditures that he has brought. You understand? But what we are saying is that the minister has gone beyond public health issues and introduced things which are not COVID-19 related at all into the request for the additional 11.8 billion that is what we are saying and i've cited the number of expenditures that are not related to covid 19 expenditures i've cited them so this this is our position that it is inappropriate it is unnecessary and it is just a way of accessing more funds in an election year it will be approved i mean uh, if the house would approve because of the numbers what next after that no, we, 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 have, we have let Ghanaians know the reason why they are bringing the uh, supplementary budget. Yes, that is our objective. And as a responsible opposition party, we have to get to the public and explain ongoings in the, uh, in the House to them. That is exactly what we, we, we have done and will do on the floor when the report comes to the House. Um, 11.8 billion. The first component is directly related to, I mean, expenditures on COVID-19. And the other one is um, the component that is directly related to uh, mitigation factors that we believe will boost um, economic activities. And then the final section has to do with security and governance. Because we are in an election year, 
and also we need to protect um, ourselves. Uh, so um, I believe that um, we explained to the committee that um, we did get some inflows and we have used those inflows to close the gap. We still have to fund the rest of the budget, the 11.8 um, billion, and we will come appropriately uh, to tell them exactly how we're going to fund it. But for now, they, they, what they really wanted to see was the breakdown of the components of the 11.8, and we have explained to them and we have shown them the components of the 11.8, which they have wholeheartedly accepted, and they will support government. I mean, they will support government to raise, I mean, whatever uh, monies that are necessary to enable us fund. I mean, this uh, section 3A. It says clearly that if there's um, 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 an epidemic, a public health epidemic, and clearly we all know that COVID-19 is clearly a public, uh, it's a public health, I mean, epidemic. So that alone gives us that footing to come back. Well, the minister really suspended the, the FRA on the floor of parliament. What the law says is that you suspend and then you come um, to the committee with explanations. And clearly we, we all know, I mean, that this has to be suspended because of all the things that have been stated in the law and all the things that we have seen happening. Revenues have gone down. I mean, um, we've had to spend on um, health-related uh, expenditures that were not budgeted for. So everything is clear. We have fulfilled the side of the law, um, um, asking and that will permit us to do what we are doing. So I believe that the committee has taken that in good faith and we will see it on the floor of Parliament in the report that clearly the suspension has been validated by um, Parliament. Hello and welcome back from the break. This is Duke's View. Of course, we're still in the budget season. The media budget review um, has this motion for the statement itself has been approved. But the House is going through the estimates. The Finance Committee, for that matter, is going through the estimates. So it's an appropriation, a supplementary appropriation that has uh, been presented to the Finance Committee and they are still going through it. And we heard the comments about the figures that have been presented to the committee. Um, and the views that were shared there by members of the committee from the minority and the majority. Uh, but based on the force of sheer numbers, we expect that this will be passed at the plenary when it is presented. But another issue that has been a matter of contention has got to do with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which puts a certain cap of 5% of 5% budget deficit of the GDP every year that a ministry, Minister of Finance should not go beyond that. If he goes beyond that, he can be, uh, you know, a subject of censure. That is, in simple terms, removal from, from office. This is one of the issues that have come up with regards to the approval of the motion for the media budget review statement. I think that the haggling and the contention over this is, is, is really not necessary. It's not necessary because it is clear, printed white and black, and, 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 and we are everybody's party or everybody understands what has gone on this year which makes it difficult for government to meet its revenues i mean in the name of politics it's not everything that has to be it's not everything that has to be contentious or controversial or debated or or, or must be a subject of of contention i think that even though the ideas are great it is good to critique on this matter i think it's the, the criticism that is coming from the other side to government really is not it's not necessary because if you would take a, a view at the issues the kind of issues that have hit government this year not only the government of ghana but governments around the world this year it is quite clear that in choosing lives and livelihoods over mere numbers or fiscal numbers of course the indicators economic indicators they show us whether things are going wrong or right but it's not everything that needs to be debated and, 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 and looked at from the fine details of numbers, especially when lives and livelihoods are at play here. And this year, everybody understands and everybody appreciates worldwide, globally, that its global supply chains have been affected. Earlier, the finance minister this year spoke about the fact that nine, nine billion in terms of losses, revenue losses from petroleum receipts and, 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 tax, and, and tax revenues are going to go down the wire. So I don't think this is an issue that should be a matter of contention and take a, 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 a and take a you know and and take a hold of the debate when other issues should be on the front burner. That's what I think you may dis disagree. Another issue that has come up again 
the Customs Amendment Act is, is, a, is, is an act that was passed by Parliament in March, but it was assented to by the President in May. And it has a six-month moratorium. This is the, 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 the law that uh, bans the importation of salvage vehicles and vehicles that are over 10 years into the country. In recent times, issues have come up over it. The Vehicle Dealers Association believe that it's going to kill their businesses. They believe that it's going to you know, affect the indigenous automotive industry. I think that it's not too late. November is about four months away. There is enough time for the t stakeholders to go around the table. Even if the law is not going to be reviewed, there should be some sort of a policy arrangement. Thankfully, the legislative instrument that would give flesh to the law that has been passed has not been even brought to Parliament and considered. So there is the opportunity for some dialogue among all the stakeholders, from policy side, from government, from the Vehicle de uh, Dealers Association, so that some sort of a compromise can be struck. So while we are moving in with international best practices and technology transfer to ensure that the big companies can set up here and produce cars and produce uh, vehicles that are fit for purpose and can help you know uh, meet the needs of the middle class and everybody who has the desire to get brand new cars the automotive industry the indigenous automotive industry the supply chain from spare parts to all others who benefit from the use of salvage cars and others that are imported should not be left to dry i think some form of a compro compromise can be reached among all of these parties so that the budded automotive industry in the country from the indigenous side will not be left to rot or for a better word will not be left to die or collapse out that's my view for the week so that's how we wrap up this week's educative and interesting and informative uh, edition of the chamber right here on CTTV my name is Duke Mensopoku keep watching CTTV for the best in programming